guys, we are uh, Project Video with Tyler and Jury. We have Helen over here. And uh, we worked really hard this week to come up with these 30 ideas, 70% of which are awful, 30% of which are okay, maybe one of which is awesome. Um, a few of our ideas that we thought were pretty unique, um, one of them was a write-off app that gives user uh, tax write-off data based on their income and location and purchases they can make. Um, another one was uh, Tinder for swingers. <laughs> Um, one that uh, I was a big fan of was uh, like a, a couple friend finding site. If you're in a relationship with you for a couple friends, you never find them. It would like link up on Facebook and figure things out for you so you didn't have to put in the time. Um, Helen, why don't you go through a few of your ideas? Wait, guys, you're already at 420, so why don't you go right down here? Let's go. Next slide. Sorry about that. Helen, you want to present the three? Okay. Our first one is based on gamified ads. Um, so the problem with that is a lot of times we're on Hulu, on YouTube, we're in the middle of watching our favorite show, and you get bombarded with an ad that you don't want to watch. Um, so we thought of a way to maybe decrease the exposure to those ads, but still get all of the brands, and all the companies, all of the customer data that they want. And that will be done um, in a survey type method, but also gamified to um, encourage participation and kind of make some fun with it. Next slide. Next one is what Tyler just mentioned, to find couple friends. Um, pretty much be couples, meeting up with other couples. So link through different social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, just kind of like group them together, give them activities to do, and hopefully they will be friends. And the third is subscription to household items. Um, we all have those items that we need every single month at the same time, every single month, we always run out. Um, so this would be kind of an app, a uh, subscription base that every single month at the same time you would get whatever items you have on your list. So toiletries, shampoo, um, laundry detergent, all that. Um, there's tons of services kind of doing it now, but we wanted to make it different by guaranteeing that um, all of our customers would get the lowest price out there. And our final idea, Yuri? Project Video. Um, so basically, for everybody who's been watching video ads or online on Hulu, YouTube, whatever internet streaming uh, platform you're on, uh, video platform you're on. So we decided to come up with a way of in your, you know, inputting games, surveys, and trivia. Um, something like this exists once already with Hulu, but it's a really horrible survey that gets no feedback. Um, and we're proposing to build either a mobile site or a mobile app um, and possibly a platform that we can leverage to advertisers so they can get that information as well. Um, make the internet engaging and let's make advertising the same way. For web users who enjoy rich content, we're tired of regular video ads and like to have fun. Video, ads for engaged internet. Thank you guys. <laughs> Very good you guys. Okay. Yes, did you find any uh, competitors? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, better than Nick. Sorry. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, oh goodness. No, you go. You get default. Thanks. What were you going to ask? Some of good questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I guess I was curious. I mean, you know, why, why don't you think this exists already? I mean, it seems like a kind of a simple thing like, yeah, like, why wouldn't people want more engaging ads? So why, why has someone else already, already done it? And did you do that research? Yeah, uh, last time any of us were on any of the sites that bombard us with ads that we're forced to watch, like YouTube or if we're playing a game, we haven't seen surveys. So there's obviously room in that market to grow. And if somebody's doing it, then they're doing it right. So you're talking about getting the advertisers what they need. What, what is it that you guys perceive they need? Well, they do want, actually, you already got into this stuff. So. I would say one of their viewing preferences of the audience, right? Um, say, for example, you're watching Boardwalk Empire, right? Say you have maybe 10,000 people online on Google watching that. As an advertiser, what would you benefit from if you could know what that audience is interested in at the beginning of the show? Like, say if you're, I don't know, Hyundai, right? And you're pushing a new car, you want to figure out, does this make sense to advertise to this crowd? Does this crowd to watch 
or the rent car, do they care about this? Right? So for us, we haven't really figured out the entire metrics that would be pulling in from the audience, but the fact that it would be a tool that they could use advertisers themselves to gain more information about a specific audience, a niche audience that watches whatever the program we're looking at. And plus, the best piece is that it would never require them to log in, like do a survey, because if they're logged in on Hulu or on YouTube, technically you should log into either Google or log into their Hulu account already, so you can know specifically who that person is, so tracking the consumer becomes a little easier. But we would need an API access to do that first. Yeah. I think one of the challenges here, advertisers are all about ROI, and, and they definitely pay for that sort of demographic data, segment analytic data, broadcast, for other services. But here they're almost you know, buying ads just to get that data. So there's no immediate ROI, right? The ROI is presumably a soft <coughs> ROI since it's down the road and they may be able to. Comparatively, isn't the ROI actually they're actually getting data? The return is immediate. Oh, it's so ROI, I'm talking about sales. Okay. Right. The, How do they sell their products by using your platform? Mm -hmm. That's the question. I think we don't think so. Maybe not. That would be the result of it on what actually is they would then check the customer or the viewer watching. So I guess, like you said, it'd be more results driven for the end. But it's not all survey based. Um, the gamification aspect of this is that there are actually games that someone would play mid show that did focus on brands and would also increase. One of the key things we thought about is allowing advertisers to access to the platform and allowing them to create their own service, their own game platform ads to customers. So even if the ROI is automatic, they could change experiences that <coughs> they're having with their um, advertisements so far. Yeah, also I know like YouTube does this where you go on and let's you choose one ad or the other to watch. Um, so this, for example, within the start of the show, they take the survey, and then the next app could be more geared depending on what answers you give in the survey or whatever. So you really the last night. I don't know, just <laughs> And I guess one of the challenges is if you are having brands create games and like interactive things, it's much more difficult and like harder to actually train brands on that. And like with YouTube right now, there's probably I'm not sure how the tool works, but you upload the video. Right, where with this, it actually have to be, it have to be someone involved to actually do coding to create that interactive experience. So there's a lot of like training ahead of time for each client. It probably isn't as scalable as having someone just upload a video. It that could be a training learning curve, or we could also introduce a third vendor as well. We have a small firm that exists, like um, one for the you might look at that, um, or over your own, or securely, you know, um, companies that have that massive pool already and have those skills already and we could sort of be the platform that connects to, you know, kind of into purely. We could also have a few kind of frameworks to start with and see kind of how that works just so brands can pick the framework they work and then the next kind of thing. But the best part is that we can test it pretty quickly. Um, I think the hardest part is in the app. Well, one, one pointer is there's a, actually, the startup I can think of that's doing the closest thing to this actually is based in Philly or after to just Philly having New York's old Saul Media, and they're trying to build interactive ad units, little games that seek to reinforce brand identity. So they actually started with like captions, and the, song, the caption was like the brand name or a brand phrase. Um, but they've actually expanded some games too. So. Isn't there somebody here that works for that? Yeah, Oh, really? Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> All right, we're looking at it. Uh, thanks for uh, the feedback, guys. Thanks, guys. Sure. We'll come back to you for a round two. Uh, hey, Harold. Good evening. I want to introduce you to Bad Company. Uh, we're a new platform company uh, focusing on the healthcare and social spaces. Uh, I'm Ben. This is Anthony. Helen and our fourth building couldn't make it tonight. Uh, as we started to ideate, sit down, start to get to know each other a little bit better, our thinking started to coalesce into five spaces, which you can see right here. Um, by the bare numbers, social kind of is at the top, but if you look at our uh, competitive scores, healthcare is a clear winner. Uh, we're kind of highly matrixed across healthcare, care management, information, and administration spaces. Um, of those ideas, we want to present three to you a night, two under the healthcare banner and one under the fitness banner. The first climb is a mobile app and wearable that has applications in the fitness and uh, recreation spaces, specifically indoor climbing. Cool. Actually, I changed the order a little bit on him. Uh, first one, <laughs> we're uh, Health Pimp. That's a bad acronym, but I want to get that word out there. Uh, predictive insurance modeling. 
So healthcare reform has really changed the way uh, you know, insurance underwriting is happening. So we want to kind of use some, let's just augment the current underwriting process, um, do some machine learning, some statistical modeling, uh, some personalization of risk for individuals. Uh, you can see it's a $500 billion industry. Um, so my background is uh, data architecture for health insurance in Philadelphia, owns an ER doc. Ben does uh, medical legal partnerships for health organizations. Um, so our skills are pretty high on there. We got some market knowledge and we got some passion for money. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's a little lag time here to use us. Uh, climb, so Ben and I met uh, as climbers in a gym in Philadelphia called Go Vertical. So we spent a lot of our, you know, our time outside of work doing that. Something we're passionate about, wearable industry is growing really big right now, mobile apps, analytics on that, uh, quantified self-movement, things in markets, $5 billion industry in the US, it's about $10 billion in Europe right now. So you see our passion is pretty high for that. We've got some good market knowledge. You know, I instruct for University of Pennsylvania for climbing and as an outdoor guide as well. Um, and we got some skills to do that kind of stuff. And the last thing scored the highest for us, it's, uh, it's called MedHub. Uh, Helen's going to give you some information about it, but basically medical office share, Airbnb for medical office space. Uh, big uh, $160 billion industry, and we're passionate about that as well. Yeah, you guys want to ask questions? Oh, so for us, or, or we're not or, through, right? And so, you got one more slide? Yeah, so we, we ended up choosing MedHub, and I think Helen can give you some more information about it. Yeah, so basically, um, in healthcare, it's a, obviously a virtual space that lags behind, especially because it requires a long runway to buy. Uh, there's a lot of cost involved. People coming out of med school are frequently going to become employers, I mean, out of residency are going to employees, yeah, they complain that they don't have the autonomy. And the cost of a medical office space oftentimes requires a 10 to 15 year lease. So this allows people to either grow or expand their network. So say if you're a cardiologist and practice for the health and expand in Jersey markets, this allows you to go into another office. And then if you think about cross-specialty, right, if you are a rehab doc and you go into a PS office, that allows for the opportunity for interdisciplinary and you know, value-added patients. Again, we're all in the healthcare space, so we're very familiar with pain points and the high costs involved in healthcare. There's a lot of money in these Cool. Cool. So then, if you said there was a potential you know, market size there, two hundred million dollars, or maybe an opportunity of two hundred million dollars um, for Meta. For Meta, yeah. Uh, one hundred and sixty billion. So, so uh, the revenue models. If you have, like, say, for example, I mean. Numbers and numbers, right? But if you look at 20% penetration of the 90,000 residents in the system right now, plus another 400,000 specialists that are in the country for that whole cross pollination, that in and of itself can provide about 187 million in revenue. So that breaks your $100 million company very easily. And that's at, you know, you do by volume, so 15% of each transaction completed. So just to give you an idea for numbers, a, a, an office space, even if you do a 300% markup, do like two hundred fifty dollars a day for the rent for a doc, but if you think about, it, they're earning seventy dollars a patient, even in a primary care setting. So even after an hour, you're already you can probably put two ten in your pocket. Your full day rent is two fifty. You can do the math if you do the eight hour day and see that many veteran patients. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot clearly with like Airbnb and just you know, logistics and legal. I mean, I'm assuming there's even probably <coughs> restrictions with. Uh, just medical space in general. Like, have you did you look into that at all, and how you guys have overcome? So, largely, a lot of medical practices tied to the doc. So, for example, malpractice, it all falls on me. So, I get sued. It's not because I get sued in my space. I get sued because you know I did something wrong. So, essentially, for a doc, what you use primarily is you need a sink to be able to wash your hands. You need an exam table to examine your patient, but less likely, you know, the location. What, so, what about the landlord? So the landlord, in terms of obligations, just required to you know keep the lights on, keep the place clean, provide an exam table, and again through various reviews, if it turns out to be like a, I mean it's if the real estate doesn't end up being a reputable place of practice, then obviously people will screen it out. I mean the landlords have to agree to the settlement though, right? Correct. 
And with Airbnb, you know, they're talking pretty you know, peanuts, so I think a lot of landlords you know, turn their head. I think that most Airbnbs in New York, for example, probably are not legitimate, probably are against the terms of the lease. Commercial real estate, they may be a little bit more severe about that. There's always. So the, the landlord in this case would be, you know, medical offices that are underutilizing their space, so they have incentive to rent it out to other doctors. So it wouldn't be like a, your, your standard landlord who has a building that you want to house a medical office space in. So you know, some examples would be like Jefferson Hospital. You know, like, and how, did you do any research into how much space is actually out there, like given a specific hospital, how many rooms are empty? Well, sure. that's, that's the interesting thing, because yeah. a lot of these hospitals have no idea. I mean, they're basically hotels that have no idea that the rooms are going to close. But if you even just do by logic, surgeons, who, you know, they're in the OR at least half a week, otherwise they're not generating revenue. Their office is absolutely so empty. So, I, I mean, I can tell you based on my experience in hospitals, those orthopedics offices, nurse surgery offices, and we have a week. And then how do you guys test this and before going out and building all this stuff? Like, what would next steps be? Next steps would be to get them pairings of docs. And again, it's not limited to just you know, I mean, you could have chiropractors, you could have you know, all sorts of alternative medicine. It, it's not localized just to one type of medical provision. So the idea is you can find dental landlords, which I've identified probably like three or four dental landlords, and just bring in docs. And because it's not commitments, if Airbnb stuff can come in for a day, and you're not necessarily going to have the same kind of thing for the full office lease. And again, you know, contrary to store five, no offense or anything, but like the good of store we apologize that um, the dollar values are higher in that office space. That's the question. Can I ask you guys a question? Assuming that this model works as you described it, can you give me the two riskiest assumptions in your model? Riskiest assumptions would be uh, folks especially coming out of this, are just so incredibly adverse that they're still gonna go run and work for a hospital. The flip counter side to that is, okay, then you approach the hospitals who still have an asset management problem, and that risk of working with enterprises with any problem you always have to wait until the enterprise gets its act together and sign off. Yeah. Um, uh, from the other side of the perspective, you mentioned quite a bit about the doctors and doctors when you go there, or then you are in their spaces. But how about the patient actually who would want to take an appointment with that kind of place? And an Airbnb kind of style, I might not be very comfortable going to uh, you know, a, a place where I know that this person might come tomorrow or might not come tomorrow. I would be more comfortable in a co-working space for, for doctors where rather than Airbnb, <laughs> if it's a co-working space for doctors, where I know that these are got these guys are going to come you know, every other week. That's that's more and better. Sure, and that's right. an excellent piece of feedback. And perhaps as you know, the idea is really fleshed out. And maybe when this at the start, you create a fixed location, and then as time. I mean, for example, like the Airbnb, it may have started where like people said fixed location, and then over time, then then it became more of a true sharing as opposed to. So it starts with co-working and then you branch out to true sharing. So the, uh, this, another risky assumption with that is that would other people, patients, be willing to come to that kind of place? Well, then in that case, you have to make a good real estate plan, make an inviting environment. Right. I mean, so you've been to too many offices that just look like they were built in the 1960s. <laughs> so if you create an attractive, um, functional place that, you know, like this, you know, people will say, oh, you know, I, I'd love to show up here, see my doctor, and as long as I'm getting good service and have a comfortable environment. Yeah, it seems like it almost makes sense to have one location that you're rotating people because, like for me, when I try to find a doctor, it's always location specific. So, if you're caught, if there are like random locations always popping up here and doctors, are, it might get a bit confusing. So, if there's one location specifically that are rotating the doctors. That and also, think that addresses a large part of the two visual problems. That's very good feedback. That's great. Cool. Thank you guys. Thanks. I'm Ryan. Um, so we'll cut to the chase. This is our 30 ideas. And basically our process for ideation was we each take terms and we just say something, an idea, a thought, a problem, no bad, no bad things to say, right? No bad so ideas. no bad ideas. And we just go around and just build on it until something happens. Uh, sometimes 
the final idea is completely different than the first thing that it's saying. Yeah, and nothing's off limits. So if you want to suggest magic, magic is okay because bad ideas are out of the box and good ideas come from things out of the box. So you don't want to limit anything. So that's kind of how we came up with some of these. Some are good, some are bad. Uh, so we'll pitch our three best ones. So um, our first idea was sort of like um, Lyft, but for like connecting restaurants with people that are willing to deliver food. Um, so for like restaurants that don't offer a delivery business and maybe the thing hindering them is like hiring people and having the overhead. And for people that uh, think that they can make money, more money on their own, like doing a bunch of deliveries in a night uh, versus like working for one restaurant. Um, so the idea was an app that basically connected the two and ideally it would keep um, a delivery person like within a geographic area so that it was a little bit more efficient. Um, so if they made one delivery from one restaurant, they could quickly hit another restaurant and another restaurant. Um, All within the same three win. So yeah. imagine delivering from Britain House to Old City, and then once you're in Old City, you pick up a delivery available in Old City. It's sort of a reconfiguration about how delivery works for restaurants, yeah. where they don't, they don't hire delivery people, but rather they sort of contract them from this and, network. And we like the idea because it seemed easy to test. Like we could just throw up a landing page and say, uh, if you're interested in being a delivery person, like being one of the first people in, sign up and see if there's even people interested in like uh, doing that kind of thing. And then we thought we could take that to a restaurant that you could see offering delivery that doesn't already. The look what we have here, are you interested in piloting it? So, uh, Groupon, how many Groupon deals do you want to get, want to buy? Um, you don't want that Brazilian wax deal? <laughs> <laughs> that one too. But um, we were thinking more of a bottom up approach where we actually get people and users to vote on ideas or even start new um, deals that they want to see and if a deal gets enough attention and a lot of votes then we can broker that deal with the um, company that deal is at what was the example Franklin so, so say like Frankfurt Hall uh, so people in Philadelphia they really want to do on pictures at Frankfurt Hall so I'll go on website um, think of it like a reddit style where you can submit deal that you want and then uh, we start with like say in Philadelphia and anybody who wants to go to Frankfurt Hall wants to deal on pictures would we'll upload that idea. Uh, the, the most in-demand deals um, from the community would start to rise up kind of like the way Reddit or any other voting sites. Now instead of Groupon which kind of tries to guess what people want, we're now identifying the demand first and then saying okay Frankfurt Hall look you've got uh, 800 people in this area who want the deal on pictures. Why don't we help facilitate this deal and Frankfurt Hall can use our service to uh, email and communicate with all those 300 people that upvoted and maybe if 30% of those people showed up that weekend, the big business is good for them. Yeah, we like this idea in particular because we can start local, um, so it could be a regional based idea and it's, the software side is relatively easy to implement but um, actually getting in contact with these companies and convincing them to make these deals and show that there's demand. Building clout. Basically. Yeah, building clout is, is the tough part. It's good yeah. Um, Next slide. All right, so does anyone know what a dink is? <laughs> yeah, dual income, no kids. So um, I was talking to my lead at work. Uh, she's 36 and she was complaining to me about how after a certain age, all of her friends started getting kids, and uh, just keep talking. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. So my lead, after all of her friends ended up getting kids, and she was saying, it "Sucks hanging out with them because all they do is bring their kids around, and <laughs> her, her and her husband, you know, they're a thing. You know, they, they're enjoying life, they're having fun, they're you know, they're traveling, but when they go and hang out with their friends and kids, there's not as much connection anymore. So for them, it's really difficult because they say." How do we go out and meet people like this? Um, so kind of imagine grouper for gay couples. So it would be difficult, say, like a double date. It's a little bit more awkward. But imagine being able to look in your area for gay couples around you and then meet up grouper style. So say you have three couples and you could charge uh, the same way grouper does it. Um, you, can, you can set up 
uh, that group of drinks at a restaurant or a bar, and everybody chips in some money, and then um, you pay for the first round, or you pay for part of the meal, etc. Um, so it's basically the exact same concept of Uber, but applied to this new demographic of people. Um, there's about 33 million uh, couples that fall into this in America, um, so it's definitely a big market. Um, this would also be really easy to prototype. It would be as simple as putting up a landing page and um, finding out, hey, in the same way we said before, where you can sign up and um, try to get data access, and you can see how many people do sign up, and if a lot of people uh, have interest in it, then you can do the human algorithm, which is you can fake it. You can just find people, and assuming the, the demand is manageable amongst a couple people, you can start setting up yourself. And once you start to get, get the ball rolling, you can start to automate that. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be easy to, to bootstrap. Questions? Or which was so, so this one was the one we liked just because it was probably the easiest to tackle. Um, we know a bunch of potential users. The skill set fits our team really well because uh, it's pretty much clearly a mobile and software development. Yeah, uh, we're mainly technical. Yeah, and I think people in couples are missing out on the fun of like online dating because it is really fun. I mean, it's sucky, but it's also really fun. And once you're in a couple, like being in a couple is great, but like looking at strangers is also really fun. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's true. <laughs> yeah, people, single people really they do enjoy it, and as a you miss out on that, or there, there are a lot of people who just stop meeting people at a certain age, it's a big problem, but they say, oh, we start hanging out with younger people because they're like us, they don't have kids, so uh, there are surprisingly a lot of big couples um, in the country, so yeah, they can bring them together. I'm, I'm a question, why, why do a couple always want to meet another team couple? Why do they? <laughs> My team couples always want to meet other team couples. I don't know where they're going. Like, okay. like it's easy. You don't have to worry about like you call up your friends you're like, hey, you want to hang out? And they're like, can't. Like don't have a babysitter. That gets annoying after a while, I think. So if you just have a network of friends that don't have kids that are going to be available most of the time, it's like. Okay. Yeah. So uh, my my lead was telling me she was saying that. Um, she can't really invite her friends out to the bar because of things that they used to do. So which, what happens is she ends up finding younger friends as they get older. And she's saying she wishes she was able to connect with all the people like her and her husband in the city. Um, so there's a big need for to, to be able to connect with people like you. And that, after your, your peer group starts having your children, that becomes a big focus of your conversations or your interactions. And she was saying she, gets un she doesn't get invited to many things anymore. Yeah. She doesn't have a kid to bring along and connect with. And also from the people who are single, they also don't want the couple tagging along as well. Yeah, so, right. you just and, yeah. Yeah. and yeah, I totally understand the whole interest in, like, I mean, every time, you know, we're with a group of friends and we're with someone who does have a girlfriend, they always want to, like, grab the Tinder, right? Because it's just fun for them to have that social interaction because sure. they, they don't have that. So that, I think all that makes sense. I think, the, you know, the one challenge that you didn't address is that you actually, you have to deal with two different marketplaces, right? You have to you have to get the consumers, but you also have to then get the restaurants or the bars or the you know event spaces, whatever it may be. So how do you how do you go about trying to get both of those markets at the same time? Um, well, I think we have to grow the consumer market first. Um, that's in contrast to our other idea, which is I want a deal where we actually have to get like the restaurants and the companies on board. Um, here we can just make reservations, right? And then we can yeah, probably we buy, can buy a drink. I don't think that's like we're not asking for a controversy. Even to start out, like we're not asking for like a deal. Like it, we could even even just go in and be like, look, this couple, this group's we're coming in. Here's the money for their first round. If it's thirty bucks a couple, it's ninety dollars a date. Like a first round of drinks for six people is probably gonna be less than that, and then that's some profit for us. Or quite a bit of profit. So you, you guys follow the blank for a blank model for a lot of your ideas, which I think is great. It's a, it's a great way to sum up an idea in three words, or just four. Um, Rupert is an interesting one to me because I think a lot of the, the successful startup that Rupert actually has not demonstrated that it's a huge business, mm -hmm. or there's actually potential for huge business yet. You guys talk about big market. I assume you're talking about people there, not necessarily business, or do you actually think it's a, a big business? Here? I think that um, I think that the whole like there's a whole online dating market, but people in relationships, unless they're uh, being unfaithful, are kind of left out of that market. And so I think this would sort of be the first thing to tap into that, which would be huge, because um, we wouldn't be too late. 
And then I, I think a big problem with Grouper is that it, it's run kind of shady. And it, like there's there's been a lot of bad things about their CEO published and stuff like that. And I feel like that has probably hurt it, the site a lot because I think it's still a good idea. Um, I could be I wrong about that dragging it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and, Tinder, which is clearly you know, $100 million. And, and in terms of this idea, I mean, we like it. One aspect of why we like it is because we think it could fail fast. Um, <coughs> we could prototype it really quickly and just start to gather like, how many people are actually actually interested in it. Also, think about every dating app. Once you find somebody on it, stop using the dating app. Sure. Not this, right? Find some friends. Oh, this is great. We're ideally, you keep using it to find more friends, right? So there's no. Uh, the barrier to using it is less. Well, theoretically, right? Theoretically. But, but look, I mean, you can get comfortable. But, but you can get comfortable. Being the dick at this point, right? Because yeah. I, I've practiced a few times before yeah. I'm in this current marriage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I can tell you that there's a, there's a you know a finite amount of time, yeah. right? If, that you have. Sure. So you know, and, and there are people that you do and don't like to be around, and after a while, you find some that you like to be around quite a bit. And you mm -hmm. you tend to spend a lot of time with them. I'm just kind of thinking oh, so there, there, there could be the same sort of ceilings. You know? yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the challenges I think with the group is that maybe why they're, they're not growing as quickly is because they're actually dealing with both, they're dealing with the matching, but then they're also dealing with like facilitating what happens after the matching. Right. right? Like Tinder is just matching 100%. Right, so like, do you guys think that you'll place more emphasis on the matching in the very beginning or more on the facilitation of like, or facilitating an actual you know, hangout? Well, we can think about that part. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting point. Like, which, which is I think facilitating, honestly. I mean, because like, matching is something you can kind of own, as long as you don't get it totally wrong to start out with. But if you don't, it, like, I think if you just get out there and start facilitating these meetups and like it works, then you're more likely to kind of have the word of mouth spread, where it's like, if, if somebody goes on like a group date with somebody that's a slightly better match than them, because you worked on the matching, like they're not going to be like, like that little like ten percent bump in the matching or whatever isn't going to make as much of a difference as just facilitating dates at work. So I think I think as long as you don't get it totally wrong, like you don't match somebody with people that are completely opposite of them and they have a terrible experience. Um, like, I think matching is where you have a lot more room to tinker, um, but facilitating is something that you kind of you have to show that you're capable of like, immediately in order for it to work. I want to ask this one final question. Do you think, you talked a lot about the matching side. Do you think your riskiest solution, and this, I'll say this again again, is on the matching side or on the business side? The riskiest what? The sun side. That you guys are making the business side. Are saying, the business are saying, business saying that businesses might not want these reports on the end. No, no, I'm asking you guys, what is your riskiest assumption? So your riskiest assumption is the idea, or the, the, the assumption that you guys are making about this idea, mm -hmm. that if it falls apart, the whole business falls apart. Well, I think it just it doesn't catch on. I think it sort of has to, it, it needs that viral growth. Um, it needs to like really catch on and be thought of as something trustworthy. Also, uh, another one is, when, this, is, this is a friend thing. It's not driven by romance. So like people being completely outside of your network of friends, are people gonna to wanna to jump to that? That's maybe an assumption. We're making an assumption that like couples would want to meet random couples they have no connections with. That would still tend to be the risky the riskiest assumptions in the business side. Okay. But that's that's kind of what I was asking is, is like what is the, the biggest thing you guys have to solve that if you don't, this falls apart and that's the thing you want to spend most of your time thinking about focusing on and trying to solve as quickly as possible. Thanks guys. One quick comment. culture, a lot of dates are gay people, and there's all this social infrastructure already in place, gay-friendly businesses, gay-friendly social That's a great point. where you can get a lot of this work solved. Oh, that's a great point. We're going to start with that community, and that kind of gets some of our reality just off that. We did not make a PowerPoint, so all you guys get is a spreadsheet. And all you get is a bunch of text. All right, we have three ideas, and our team is sort of a three-pronged team. We are all very busy people. We couldn't complete the assignments in the way that we would have wished to, but they have an idea. We have, I have an idea, and he has an idea, and we're going to present these three ideas. So they okay. go first. So the first one is called Sale Guru. So basically, it simplifies your shopping experience. So imagine you want a product. It can be a specific 
as an HD TV Samsung with a specific size TV, or it can be something very general like a black dress that's kind of high end apparel. So you basically enter it into our website, and what we do is we scan all the different websites and retailers aggregate that information for you. So you have it all in one place. Um, on top of that, we utilize historical discount information by store and department and basically offer you kayak-like advice, whether to buy it now or um, wait based on a likelihood that it will go on sale in the future. So just as an example, there is a $1,000 TV that's selling online. Uh, you already have a TV, so to you that's $1,000 is a little too expensive, so you want to pay $700 for it. So in our website, you would look up this TV, you would enter $700 as the price that you were willing to pay, and you can either set it as uh, buy now or uh, set an alert to send to you later if the price hits that $700. How do you know that it should be $700? We are making a suggestion. For example, best computers or TVs and Best Buy historically have experienced discounts anywhere from 10 to 30%. So you can enter anywhere from 30% likely to that you will get it on sale. Uh, we would also give a suggestion of what's the time frame for the sale. So for example, in the next month or in the next two months, it, will, it is likely that it will go on sale. Um, and our value, I guess, um, so this is our value proposition to the customer. Uh, now, how do we make money? So we make money through uh, an affiliate marketing fee. Uh, that is, Amazon has affiliate marketing program, for example, where they will pay you 8% um, from every sale that you drive to their, tra uh, to their website. Yeah, and also if you select to kind of wait, there will be a feature, so it's kind of like a stock, a stock limit order. So say for example, it's on sale right now for $800, but you are only willing to pay $700. So you can put that price as your, your highest willingness to buy that purchase price, or that, that product for that price, and it will alert you when it goes at $700 or below. So that's idea number one. Idea number two. Number two. Number two. Uh, many industries have moved to the cloud, uh, for instance, the auto industry. Um, might go to a car dealership and all they have are terminals at their, at their desks and uh, they don't even have a server on site. It's all done in the cloud, financing, inventory, things like that. And, um, and there's certain spaces, pockets that have missed that opportunity. And in my case, I've always noticed that uh, the dental and the orthodontic Arena. As many players, there's uh, Kodak, uh, which has Roy Big Track, there's uh, Eaglesaw, which has uh, Centrix. Um, but they're all server based, on site, on location, uh, digital imaging stored on location. So there's always a, a, an IT overhead cost for dentists and uh, the, the interaction between the insurance companies with their systems, etc. To lower the costs on those independent dentists or dentists, uh, I propose creating some sort of cloud-based system. A consolidated cloud-based system. Consolidated, it would uh, reduce their IT overhead. It would uh, simplify their uh, the connectivity, I guess. Uh, those sort of things. And you go but niche by niche, right? So you start with that, you get then later experience. Right. Idea number three. I used to hate to cook, and then about a year ago I started to cook, and I still, man, I'm getting better at it. Um, but in my household, we recently switched entirely to Peapod, for example, um, in our example, um, for old groceries. We no longer go to stores, it saves us a lot of time, parking hassle. Um, my household consists of two very busy uh, professionals with no kids, although people could have kids and still be that. Um, what we do is we always buy the stuff that is on sale. And last week we ate these great juicy porterhouse steaks. Uh, and they were cheap because they were like 40% off. Um, this week I think we're getting chicken drumsticks. Um, and I briefly ran the numbers once uh, and compared the numbers to my best friend who's sitting right there with a big smile because he overspends way too much in groceries. He's also, he, he, he's, he's always like to go. Anyway, so the idea is a web-based system where you go there, you enter a bunch of stuff that you like to eat. Now, 
Initially, I thought maybe you enter the ingredients, but you know, lasagna, steak, you know, various marinades. The system could actually determine what kind of um, ingredients you need. Then you enter what you have in the fridge, and that's your sign-up process. You can later add recipes, and then you sort of just have this list. And there are the competition would be kind of like the recipe categorizing. Um, apps where you know you say you know what you what you want to make and they give you the list of the ingredients but then I, I, I tried one app and they were like you need to buy this one egg what the hell um gotta wrap up right so um scrapes peapod or fresh direct for data of what's on sale creates generates a weekly meal plan of the stuff that you like to eat and suggests that based on Nutrition plus um, price, what's on sale plus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would like to hear your feedback criticism. Which one is the final? Um, we don't have a final. Ours. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, for your example, yeah. it's interesting is today I was probably yeah. on. Maybe seven seven different websites. I was on Amazon. I was on uh, BestBuy.com, yeah. Everlane.com, all of these different places. And if you think about any potential user that's using your platform, how you know how do you get to the scale where when someone comes to your site, you have the information that they potentially need? Right. I mean, Best Buy is one example where someone wants a specific TV. That means you're going to need to crawl Best Buy. I mean, every single potential website that has pricing on a TV. I mean, how, how do you get to that scale where it's actually usable right away for any user? So we would start with a minimum viable product where would be, we would be the ones doing the work, but eventually uh, we would be scraping through websites that are affiliated with us. Uh, so we are targeting anyone, uh, any company that is mid to higher end. Uh, for example, we're talking about if it's consumer uh, apparel, that's what we're talking about, Mr. Bloomingdale's <coughs> Nordstrom, uh, J. Crew, Banana Public. If we're talking about electronics, that's, that's Best Buy and Target. Um, so those are the stores that we would include at first, uh, as well as Amazon. You could even scrape Google Shopping. And yeah, and then Amazon, for example, it provides you with uh, IPI data where you already have this, um, this, the tags available to you for each product, and they give you the information. And part of the challenge would be that you know these sites actually want people to browse versus like searching specifically for one thing because it encourages them to purchase other products. So you know, will sites actually will Best Buy be willing to give their data and be open to giving your data when they actually want consumers to go and see that this TV is on sale, knowing that they're going to put a more expensive TV right above it, so you know consumers potentially buy that one that's more expensive. Well, I think that our site will cater to those who know specifically what kind of TV they want, but also they can put something general, like television within um, kind of a broad range, and then our site will still allow them to browse. They could also be boosted by user feedback ratings, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Best Buy might be better than a small time <coughs> retailer, so they could get the results boosted. Also, there's, it's sort of like price discrimination, I would say. Um, there are customers who are willing to buy at a market price, and then there are some customers who um, may not, they are willing to wait, they're checking back, they forgot about the product, that's a lost sale. So that is, this is eliminating the lost sale. So I'll move on to your idea. Is there an MVP there, or do you have to go into that full steam ahead, raise tens, hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars? Uh, the MVP, I need you to find that. You know, TAM was the, was the uh, total. So, so, it, so, 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 was. How do you convince yourself that that's <laughs> what well, is there? That there's a big enough market? No. No, you can actually tackle that market. I'm, I believe you there's a big enough market. How do you convince yourself that, that you can actually. Well, the, how skill set, you mean? Like, like, uh, how do you get it done? And, yeah, how do you get it done? Uh, uh, presentable. Yeah. How do you convince yourself that you guys can get that done? Well, in the case of in the case of like, practice management software, stuff like that, the concept is is simple enough. Where it's database driven, it's form driven, um, it doesn't need to be this huge uh, skill set like scientifics and you know things like that. Uh, so it seems that in scope, it's narrow. 
And I'm going to add to that, um, Larry and I have very complementing um, skill sets here. I know portal development and cloud portal development, and I don't think it's rocket science. I mean, it's a lot of work, but it is not rocket science. And he has worked in this industry for, he's actually a lot older than he looks. By the way, he's 41. I do let him work. Uh, uh, so, 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 the technology so he has the connections yeah. in the industry. Even like before the technology, like when I go into my doctor's office right now, I mean, there's literally like the size of this wall is just documents everywhere. Right, know, and right? they're slowly so, upgrading. Yeah, right. So how do you, you know, how do you get them to make? How do you get that to make? Very good question. He has done IT for them. He's maintained their servers. Yeah, and he gets paid a ton of money to do that. And he can go, look, you can pay a lot less and we'll just give you this product which will work better and you will save a lot of money. A lot of places are actually doing dual, you know, they're trying to, they have these practice management systems, but they're still keeping paper charts. So they're kind of doing that uh, as they migrate, but they're doing it slowly, very cautiously. And, um, you know, I, I understand what uh, the, the concern that they have. They have a little bit of apprehension going since it's digital. Yeah, I guess I'm going to address wow. that. Yeah. You know, so, so you got to, I, I don't know, uh, I haven't thought that part out. Prototype and convinced. But I mean, they had, oh, they're all connected to the internet as well. So I guess you have to go through their, their experience, how it has the internet, the broadband service, things like that. Won't be in the case of an outage. But it's just like any other industry, like, like the auto industry I was talking about. Um, could fall back to a paper-based system just in case where the data would be entered later. There could be one you know, of the contingencies. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is there's an example from like uh, seven years ago. I did this with a firm that was doing compliance testing in the oil industry, and they had 43 pages per site. It's all electronic. I mean, it, you're right. It was a, a bridge you had to build to get to the cost. But once they saw the time it saved and right. sort of the regulatory hurdles they no longer had to like really kind of think about for bringing them back and scanning and all. Um, once you showed them the time savings and, and the hurdles that they cut out, it seemed to be sort of a self-selling system. Uh, I, I think there's, there's, there's obvious value from them. Yeah. It strikes me as a, the idea that it's tough to MVP, it's tough to sort of to test without truly you know, committing to raising money and yes, getting him the compliance. And Plus, uh, another thing that has going forward is that uh, you know, the medical side, yeah. uh, uh, general practitioners, things like that, a lot of them are going into these bigger health systems, uh, Jefferson, whatever. And on the dental side, I see a little bit of it uh, pro you know, but especially on the orthodontic side, I just see like, so you get a lot of little individual players that you can convince individually. And, uh, so you can get started. Tyler. All right, we got to get this. All right. Hey guys, uh, my name is Mahesh Narayan of Belgium, Belgium. and uh, we are ModX Plus. Uh, don't ask me what the meaning is, these guys came with it. Uh, so uh, again, our idea, uh, our, I guess our process for ideation was uh, you know, pretty much, as most people did, you know, kind of just throw out ideas. Uh, but uh, rather than just you know, putting in ideas and then thinking about it, we kind of discussed a lot more of what the market is. and uh, you know who the user is going to be even before we put it up there. So we actually came up with probably more ideas than we needed to uh, when, when we filled this up. But uh, yeah, so go down the next one. Uh, so uh, I guess out of the 30 ideas that we had, uh, the first one we kind of liked uh, and thought you know, was a viable uh, business model, or had a viable business model, uh, was Calendar Plus. Uh, so the idea behind that is pretty much, again, it's a smart personal assistant uh, for task and uh, prioritization uh, based on a proprietary uh, operation management slash uh, machine learning uh, you know, backend algorithm. So to the front end user, it pretty much looks like you know, it's artificial intelligence. But what we're doing in the background is kind of taking information from your calendar, from your emails, uh, you know, kind of integrating what Google already has, kind of using their, you know, their, their background or demos the background and bringing all the data into one area and kind of prioritizing tasks that you should fill out first before going forward. I, I think, again, Something that I've seen is I have a to-do list that I use quite often, but uh, th that doesn't necessarily be a prioritization. I think you know I should do one thing before I should do another, whereas I probably should have switched it to make you know make it more efficient. Uh, so our, our idea is pretty much you know kind of bring, bringing that together where you know the machine can actually prioritize for us uh, before we get to that you know to that task. And so we're kind of just following a task that you know in, in a uh, 
guess, in an order that we need to to get you know, to get the most efficiency out of it. Uh, and then again, we again we also we also have a target market of about again two billion dollars. That's again a rough estimate, kind of on what uh, Google has uh, currently going with Google Calendar and Google uh, Docs. Uh, and Google clearly is, is the, the biggest competitor there, uh, but. Our team preparedness, again, I think we have the design and the software know-how. What we probably lack are interface design as well as you know, web development. So you have more videos? Yeah, next, yeah, I guess. Go ahead, no. Yeah. Can you scroll a bit? Yeah. Um, so the next idea is uh, network traffic lights. So basically, you, know, you go through the city, you have certain blocks that are just packed and other ones that are not, and the lights don't mm -hmm. take that into account, right? At night, you wait. The intersection, but the crosswalk says don't cross. So the idea of this is every traffic light would have some sensors that tell them who's around it, what's there, um, and then each one is linked to its neighbors. So you have kind of a distributed network flow algorithm that routes the traffic through the city more efficient. You can reduce the, the space needed for motor vehicles and get more to pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, and you know, make the city basically more more human friendly, more environmentally friendly, probably also, but that would not necessarily be the main goal. Um, so the market is, you know, we estimated two billion, but probably bigger, you know, in the U.S. alone, there are, uh, I forget how many thousands of miles of road, not all of it, it's traffic lights, but all the big cities do. Um, there are a couple small. Projects that have been done, uh, BMW, Siemens, a couple others, and some papers that have been written, but not much that has been implemented that does this. All right, so the final idea that we um, ended up settling with was a rehab platform for physical therapy and rehab based on video games. And the idea, the positioning statement we identified was, as you see, a high-tech physical rehabilitation platform connecting commercial video games to existing therapy equipment for cutting edge clinics who want to achieve best patient outcomes. And the idea is that unlike existing therapy systems that have clunky custom games that they've developed for therapy, um, our platform allows therapists to use you know, the best that the game entertainment industry produces and harness that motivating power to motivate patients to be compliant with their therapy routines and even open up home-based therapy. So there's a lot more to say there, but I want to go ahead and open up two questions and go from there. Which one? It's the last one. Last one. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. I wanted to hear about the uh, it's a miracle or idea uh, yeah, the third list. <laughs> How does that work? There's actually a number of them that already exist, uh, but we just think of something that you know is super cool or whatever. Like you just take it in and you know, a few seconds well, later. It's I guess the most common way is fresh rice uh, air can condense the or decrease the for like sixty dollars off Amazon, you get something like spins it around, and sprays it with freezing water. You can get the little wine cooler ones at the beer end. That's not it. <laughs> Anything but, and it takes plenty. So how do you know we view this? What's that? How do you know we view this? How do you? What's your starting point here? Well, I mean, full disclosure, we're already working on this. Um, the so the key first step is a. You know, universal adapter that lets you hook all sorts of things up to standard consoles, and so that's what we've prototyped. Um, and there's applicability there, not just in rehab, but also in just like accessibility and making it so that people can play video games <coughs> and otherwise. So the custom controllers, basically. What's that? Yeah. <coughs> great custom controllers. Exactly. Um, so, and then in the rehab context, it has to go a lot further, like developing a whole rehab platform that will basically. That can like you know adaptively adjust the difficulty of using the controllers and things like that. Um, so you can like automate the therapy. You can also collect a lot of data and do like offsite um, monitoring and monitoring patient progress. Well, the doctors will have competition, huh? They'll be competing with each other to get their patients through quicker. I <laughs> read <laughs> my doctor. It's very topical. Our hardware hacking is like, is very hot right now. If you guys have the right background, it's a great place to like, dabble. Well, I have, I have more of a business management and um, a marketing side background, where these guys kind of put the systems and robotics. Any questions?
in physical therapy about repetitive uh, actions. So that's right. the beauty of using video games. I mean, I don't know if you've watched someone play a game, but it doesn't look very interesting unless you're watching the screen and they're doing a whole bunch of repetitive motions. So if you hook up the, the right uh, equipment, therapy equipment, to, to exercise the channel that the game requires to, to get through the game, you end up using it without even thinking about your strength. I actually work at the um, the new robotics rehab lab of Penn Medicine, and um, we've uh, we've integrated our device we call the Hoxbox into one of their rehab systems, and I've been testing it with the patient. It's been pretty promising results so far, just as far as like you know they're just like playing Mario Kart and stuff like that when they're doing their therapy. And, um, <laughs> so. It seems like your idea matches exactly what you guys. No, so it's, I mean, a lot of this stuff is kind of way over my head and really technical, so not that much. Well, I'm, I'm curious, no, no, we, we don't have time, right? But I'm, I'm really curious about the traffic management. I mean, that, that, sound, that has to be huge, right? I, I mean, guys, because you can't build any more roads in any of these old cities, right? So it's got to be huge to get people through quicker. Um, I tried that with my own ideas because they weren't startup ideas. How do you see these ideas applying to the massive scale? Yeah, the rehab stuff? Or the traffic light stuff. I mean, it's okay, either way, I mean, it's this kind of business. Yeah, I mean, the rehab market is really right for disruption right now. There's a lot of movement from, especially just looking in the literature, like there's a lot of movement from just kind of, you know, all, all clinics kind of have their own way of doing things to now, like, you know, taking, um, you know, making measurements, tracking data, tracking progress, and doing more evidence based medicine. Um, so rehabilitation robotics um, and just like sensorized devices for rehab um, is um, really hot right now. Like there's a you know every three publications and there's a rehabilitation around that. But um, there's there's not a lot of integration of these systems or ways for it. It's, it's difficult to integrate into existing rehab workflows. So if we have uh, a platform that makes it really easy to integrate that and also provides motivation, it's the type of thing that could be um, kind of take off over rehab clinics like anywhere and also support off-site rehabilitation, which is also a huge market. Obviously your core is like you have technical uh, ability. In terms of the getting back to the MDT, you guys have any ideas in terms of actually go like outside the rehabs that you're working at in terms of the market <coughs> contributions. So I, uh, I know that's coming up in the good case. Yeah, we've been talking to people, people are very interested, but we haven't handed down what we're giving them to use as a first step. It's kind of part of what we're hoping to make progress on through this. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks, guys. Okay, um, so we uh, did a little brainstorming individually and came together uh, to develop our list of, of 30 ideas. Uh, they range in, in areas from apps for virtual races to an app for lunch ID where you can invite somebody to have lunch with you um, through an app. Things like uh, like a city concierge train together remotely. Um, they really like, could pull together a sort of our own experiences in our family life, in our personal life, in our fitness life, uh, and areas where we felt like there was just a need. So this one's mine. It's pretty much like we don't base what we want. Um, think of it like you just graduated college and moved to a new city. You don't really know one in the area. Uh, this is a site where you would go to. You can list your activities and how you're interested in find people in the city who are also interested in this kind of stuff. And it will be like meetups that they have meetups, monthly meetups, but more social, so that you can get more comfortable so you don't have to take the dive in to meet up with complete strangers right away so you can talk to them more for bridge connections and then that way when you meet up with them it's more easier to actually make friends. Um, so this one is about, uh, so there is a huge market out there for consignment furniture and also custom made furniture um, but it's really really hard to find it locally. Uh, so there's Craigslist, but that's just people putting up all kinds of crap, um, and there are a couple other things, but it's the idea of actually being able to go on a map and say, I'm willing to travel this far and I'm looking for a farm table, um, 
that is something. So I work in a vintage furniture shop uh, one day a week, and I know that people come in all the time, and they are always asking, "Are you online?" And these vendors are tech savvy, but they don't um, like really know where to start. They put some stuff on Facebook, some stuff in other places. So the idea is that this is like a marketplace for um, vintage furniture and custom made uh, furniture, and so uh, there are competitors out there. One King's Lane is a huge one. Um, and they have a large portion of the market right now, but they're very much focused on brand names. Like if you really care about um, some, like what would be popular? I never, so exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> popular. the thing is like, I think that the people looking for this stuff don't care about brand names. There's a lot of people out there who just want really cool stuff that tells a story um, that they, you can come into their house and say, oh my God, where'd you get that card catalog? And they can tell you about the person they bought it from. Um, or where they got it. So, um, Flea Pop is also out there and Cherish. Um, Cherish is the scariest to me because it's backed by a lot of people right now. It's very new. Um, but that also is focused on brand names. Um, so, oh, hey. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's this idea. And you can, you're and your perfect time. time. Yeah. You can be sure to stay okay. between the two white. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sure. Um, okay, sorry about that. I um, went to go feed the meter and the door was locked. Um, okay, so my idea was pantry. And um, I, the idea is basically um, the way to catalog items that you have in your, in your kitchen and um, ensure that you never again end up with five jars in the in your refrigerator because you didn't realize you had mustard already. Um, so it was kind of difficult to calculate the total available market because there's very little data on um, the competitors and kind of how much money they were making, if any. Um, so unfortunately, it seemed like there was very low utilization. There's, there's quite a few um, apps out there on in the app store that kind of have some of the basic functions of pantry. Um, but if you're using the rule of thumb that I guess for every review, there are 100 people that have downloaded the, the app, there are very few people that have actually downloaded it. So, um, you know, we did the comparisons, but, um, and there's definitely a strong interest among the team. I actually think that pantry, um, there's a kind of a larger vision for pantry going beyond just keeping track of what you have because there are apps that do this already. But, um, you know, being more of a food life management system, you know, so a way for you to um, improve your eating, like fitness, like Fitbit improves your, your, um, your, exercise, your exercise habits um, by getting you some data and um, allowing you to, um, you know, be more engaged in what you're eating and how you're feeding yourself. So that's, that's pantry. Which one do you guys pick? Fixed pound local. Um, so the positioning statement is for style and cost conscious people who prefer small local shops or big box stores and people over brands. Found local is a curated marketplace that simplifies the hunt for solid, beautiful vintage and handcrafted furniture sold by local pickers and makers. Unlike the biggest competitor, One King's Lane, um, it makes it easier to connect with the community of vendors. If you think about Etsy um, and also the Hatchery is another really popular one right now. Um, you know, you want to know who you're buying from. And I, I think that's a really big thing for people right now. Um, think about CSAs and, and other uh, similar models. So. Questions? So for, for this specific example, so I, I shop from um, Jinx Philly mm -hmm. pretty often. And I mean, for, for me, like the biggest challenge is actually the shipping, right? And that's what seems mm -hmm. to be their problem as well, right? The reason they don't have the yeah. e-commerce site is because it would they don't they have, have a lot of demand. And, <laughs> It's just this massive issue with like how do we package all these random different things that we yeah, don't totally. have and stores I, for. So is that is that is shipping yeah, the really thing the is, problem? No, or? so shipping it, this is there's no shipping. So I started talking to vendors and people just like Jinx, like there's great stuff, really good prices, but they don't want to deal with having to ship things, and then consumers don't want to pay exorbitant shipping costs. So the idea is that if you keep it local, um, you know, you can pick up or schedule local delivery. There are people who sell great stuff that are like 45 minutes an hour out. Google will do free delivery. So it's really about just connecting and finding the shops and then figuring out with them and helping them really to work with you. Uh, they just don't want to deal with the shipping. So does that then shrink the market somewhat? Because it does, for, for yeah. me, like, I love Jinx and 
it's you know I can actually just grab something, hop on the subway, and take it home. But I would yeah. love I would love to find another Jinx in California, right? Mm -hmm. That like has a totally different style or feel yeah. of products. Yeah, I think it does, um, and it's something that we have to like test. Um, one of the ideas someone had, um, I mean, a good idea that has come up is just get. Uh, partnering with some kind of delivery service so you can just offer really cheap delivery instead of regular shipping through USPS or UPS. Um, there are people, like I, I was talking with one guy who has this strange arrangement with this delivery woman who drives from like Vermont, like Maine down to Florida and she has a route and she drops furniture that way. So there are other things that I need to get more familiar with, but um, there are options. I also think that there's nothing stopping you from shopping from another city. You can probably just search it that way. You, you can search it that way, but, but um, yeah. Like the shipping, because you, you, like if someone yeah. found, like someone yeah. from California found Jinx and found some of the cool yeah. stuff, yeah, they'd have to like manually figure out the shipping, so that's yeah. kind of like a hesitation. But I don't want to focus just on that. That's a, that's a problem that's been in other industries that they've addressed, so I'll, I'll bet that that could get worked out pretty quickly, right? Because these trucks never want to come back from one coast to the other empty. Right. So I'm certain if you have something out there that somebody here wants to buy, I'm, I'm fairly certain there's an opportunity to work that out. You yeah. mentioned that Etsy as a brand share the same values, but you don't listen to this competitor. Why don't you see this competitor? I don't think, um, so I, I assume from the beginning that they were the biggest competitor, um, but they, with a lot of the vendors I've talked to and people who are selling at flea markets and that kind of they're not on Etsy. And I asked why, and they said, oh, that's for small things, that's not for furniture, I don't want to, and the shipping thing, I don't want to deal with shipping. I said, well, they have local, you do know you can search for just Philadelphia. And they're like, yeah, I, I just, that's not for me, that's for crafters. I sell furniture. But then I think they would be, still would be it. Maybe in terms of mind share, people might think to yes. Etsy, but then the things that they want. But yeah, that's... What about t Touch of Modern? Does anybody use Touch of Modern? I was just crafted. It's, it's, it's a little thing where it's like super boutique furniture. Uh, other stuff too, but sometimes it's super boutique furniture. That's like, you know, $5,000 for a coffee table, but it's on sale for $3,000. I still can't afford it, but, but it's really nice stuff. And what they do is, the estimated shipping time is five to nine weeks. You know, so it's almost like you can actually sell stuff that you haven't made yet. Yeah. you know, and that could be something for your managers to consider. Yeah, yeah, one of the things, the, another competitor I consider putting up there is this really cool site um, that I found this week, I didn't know it existed, called Custom Me, and they, you can, um, you know, fill in and say, I want a custom shelving unit <coughs> made, and I want to use US only wood uh, workers, and then they have a network of woodworkers, and they send that out and you get pricing back. Um, but then I started thinking, um, so I'm reading the, Traction book, and I started thinking about them as a partner, rather like maybe maybe that wouldn't be something to pursue as part of this, but maybe a partnership or something. Any other questions? Just to touch on uh, the shipping that you mentioned before, one of the downsides to I, well, I did research on One King's Lane and sites like Gill and all those flash sites was the shipping that they take forever to come, where they like are really long. Right. But the, the, the coffee table I was referring to is my green coffee table. It's they literally take a <laughs> humongous tree and they take a slice and the entire tabletop is a slice of this humongous tree that they just you know finish and it's just thick, you know. So yeah. it's literally you could have a shop with this humongous tree and every time you get an order. I used to do the age. advice I would give um, are, uh, I think, in, if I'm going to play the role of VC, 
properly tonight, I'm going to give two pieces of totally contradictory advice. Um, the first one is people, you know, everyone really talked about like, how, how well suited they were in terms of their, their skills and like their experiences. I think the other thing to look at is like their passions. Um, you know, I think the, the, in a perfect world, the best idea for you guys is the idea that like you have to do uh, because you don't have a choice because that's what you wake up every morning thinking about. And you can't get out of your head until you try, uh, until you sort of you know, you give it a chance and see if it actually can stick. Um, the second piece of advice, which is totally contradictory, is that you need to pick an idea that you actually can test in, in the next few months, you know, ideally in the next 90 days. Um, because if this is an idea you're passionate about, uh, you, uh, you need to, to set those metrics so that you can actually find some objective way to evaluate how well it's going. Um, because uh, like, you know, we could have gone uh, sideways for years on Storyly. Um, we had our we had raised venture capital, which gave us the very clear uh, objectives where we had to be in 12 months, and we could back into that to know where we had to be in 90 days, and that ended up being critical for us. Um, I don't think anyone here has raised VC for their ideas in the last week. Um, if you have, congratulations. Uh, but if you haven't, you still need to set those deadlines. Like, what, where do you have to be in 90 days? Obviously, and some of these ideas today were incredibly ambitious. Obviously, not the sort of thing you can build in in three months. So, with what fraction that can you build in three months? You know. What 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 one data point can you get? Um, uh, I love the fact that I heard the phrase "fail fast" tonight. Um, that's a phrase that entrepreneurs love to throw out. People are tend to be really bad at it. So, um, if the one learning you can get in 30 days is one idea failed really fast, that's still a valuable learning, and, uh, and I think that that would be a, a pretty good outcome for the next three months. And for me, I think I'm. <clears throat> I'm interested in seeing how people start to just quickly test these ideas. I know, we've, you know, we had a bit more time to test our ideas, and, and we had money, and you know, so we had some leeway there. But I think that you know, for all of you, you're probably all not set on that number one idea, right? You probably went back and forth with the group, and you still may be kind of balancing that line on which idea to go to, to move forward with. And so I think there are probably like very small tests that you can run or surveys you can launch that can kind of help you in the direction of which idea to actually move forward with. So um, although I can't name ideas of how you can do that off the top, for each of your ideas off the top of my head, like I'd be happy over email to go back and forth. And I, cause I really like doing that. I think that's one um, asset I brought to the table when we were, when we were um, you know, in, the, in the ideation stage, figuring out well, how do we take this larger idea and boil it down to a simple test or a simple survey or a simple social experiment. Um, so I think it'll be really important before you decide which one you're eventually moving forward with. Yeah, and I, this is our second of, of two nights participating with you guys, but I'd love to, to stay in touch and, and hear more about how these are going. And feel free to email me or Brendan if uh, we can be of help um, as you guys are, are, are trying to flesh these guys out. What are your emails? <laughs> uh, it's, it's nick at curalite.com, brendan at curalite.com. Awesome. Now we have a visual share that with you guys. And whoever wrote the write up last week, that was awesome. Thank you. That was that right? Oh. Sweet, that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and they got syndicated for me by Technic. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff, so I just wanted to yeah, share. I love the video, too, I think. So. Well, big. Or, yeah, yeah, or, 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 or,